Dr. Rihanna Maktoufi has recently defended her PhD in Media, Technology, and Society at Northwestern University. She's currently a Rita Allen Foundation Civic Science Fellow at WGBH Nova. Her main fields of interest are science communication, misinformation, curiosity, public engagement with scientists, and science communication in media. She is a health communications expert turned science communications expert, so we bring her back to her health communication days with another discussion on addressing vaccine hesitancy. When approaching patients with vaccine hesitancy, it's important to recognize that we make many decisions with emotions, not with facts. And fighting misinformation with information probably won't work. The key is trust. Find out the source of their hesitation and never dismiss it. Trust starts with relationship building, and then the conversation may end with addressing those concerns. We also discuss how we can build trust in patients from communities that have justifiable mistrust of the medical establishment. And one final key, never bring up misinformation with your patients because it actually plants the seed of it possibly being true. Before starting a PhD, Dr. Maktoufi has been working as a health communication facilitator and cancer preventative palliative care campaign manager in Tehran, Iran. She was a visiting researcher at the Adler Planetarium, where she studied science communication and facilitated workshops on communication skills, and she's also a producer at the Story Collider podcast. Ray currently enjoys working with different nonprofits, such as the Communicating Science Conference, ComSciCon. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians, Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to share a great opportunity brought to you by my friend Jimmy Turner over at The Physician Philosopher. This is for all the physicians out there who are trying to find balance, but are overwhelmed by the daily to-do list and all their responsibilities as partners, parents, and physicians. Or maybe you're doing okay, but you want to do great. Does this sound like you? If so, then the Alpha Coaching Experience is the answer you've been looking for. This 12-week coaching program includes weekly group coaching and one-on-one coaching sessions, plus a course library full of self-coaching tools. It's one of the only programs with doctors coaching doctors. So if you're looking to reduce your burnout, improve your satisfaction in life, and create a life you love and deserve, don't wait. Spring enrollment is on sale now. The doors for Alpha Coaching close on February 22nd at midnight, for more information, go to drpodcastnetwork.com slash alpha. That's drpodcastnetwork.com slash alpha. Dr. Rihanna McTufi, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Brad. It's good to be here. So with regards to the vaccine, people are experiencing hesitation because of, it seems like three main reasons. One was the speed with which it was created. Another is the new mRNA technology. It's different from traditional vaccines, and just the fact that it's a brand new vaccine. So how do we counsel them about their concerns? Is this, and is it any different when interfacing with, say, the media versus a patient one-on-one? Mm-hmm. This, this is a very good question. And even in your question, you mentioned something that's key. You are talking about different reasons, right? People might be concerned about something. And I think being able to have a face-to-face conversation, that's something that is extremely valuable. And that is being able to listen to other people and understand them. There are a few rules, right, in science communication. I think one of the most important one is know your audience, right? And having access to them allows us to have that know that audience. But before anything, I think the number one rule should be know thyself. I'm an academic, right? I think a lot of us scientists, medical professionals, academics, we have been very much trained to offer solutions, right? To solve problems, to get things fixed in a way and done. And I think that gives us a little bit of this tendency that when we start conversations, when we are with people, we um, very much want to um, jump into, hey, this is what should be done. This is what should happen. And I know I do that myself. When I start these conversations, I want to get to the end where it's like, but you have to get vaccinated, but you have to do this one thing. 
And that kind of takes away a lot from building relationship and from having conversations and seeing what people are actually really worried about and what should be addressed, right? So that kind of gets us to this idea after knowing ourselves is knowing our audience, genuinely being curious about them and starting this conversation to find out, is it that they're worried about this vaccine being new? Is it that they're worried about um, the side effects that they've heard about? What is that, right? And the thing that comes with that is that we, again, might think that, oh, okay, so I'm going to give them, if I find out what they're worried about, I'm going to give them all this information so that they, they, the worry goes away. But the worry is an emotion, right? It's a feeling. I always think of this example that kind of made me realize how important it is to think about information and emotions as, as these two kind of separate things. You know, I, I always, I go to the dentist a lot because unlike my brother, I got all the cavity genes. And when I would go to the dentist, I always hear this thing before that, like, oh, the more x-rays you get, you have this likelihood of getting thyroid cancer. So I was like super scared. And when I get all this x-rays, I just like raise my, the, what do you call it? Like the protective gear thing that they give you. Oh, yeah. Um, your, your thyroid shield. Yeah. Yes, my thyroid shield. And I always like, I'm a little hesitant. I'm like, mm, do you have to do that x-ray? Until last year, when I went to my dentist, I saw this information sheet on her desk and it said basically that, you know, the dose is so little. If you go on like so many flights, the, like you're getting more exposure to x-ray, so don't worry about it. And as a scientist, I'm like, oh, information and facts. And I understand that I shouldn't be that worried about it anymore, logically. And then I went in and I sat on the chair and they were going to do the x-ray and like I immediately just like pushed the protective gear again up on my thyroid because I was still afraid, right? It's like you're getting all these information, all these facts, but an emotion is an emotion. It exists and it's really hard to change it. So you, we can't just say vaccines work and there's all these different things about them and hope that information is going to change people's attitude or behavior. There's a lot of emotions involved. And the first step for that is to acknowledge that, hey, you have these fears, you have this information, and that's legit. It's good that you're worried because it means you want to know more. You want to care about your care about yourself, care about your family. So let's discuss all the feelings that you have. What are you worried about? What part of that is it that makes you be afraid? Have you heard something? Have you seen something? And then that kind of opens that gateway of being able to talk more about the things that we actually know as facts and information, right? You have to address those emotions before you can get to the actual actual facts of it. Um, and at the same time, knowing that um, a lot of now medical staff have been vaccinated. And this is great because then you, you can tap into your personal emotions. You can tap into your personal experience saying, listen, I was worried about it too, right? But here's my experience. And at the same time, here's what we do know. And here's what we do not know about vaccines which gets us to the idea of transparency because you want to build a relationship. You don't want to say something that might not be true anymore tomorrow and completely destroy that relationship. So there's a lot of different ways to start addressing these different things. And it's very helpful to have that face-to-face -face interactions because then you can tap into all these different pieces of information that they're giving you about themselves and helps you realize, oh, these are the follow-up questions that I need to ask. And this is something that could actually be helpful rather than me entering a conversation thinking that these are all the things I'm going to talk about. So... I'm still not clear on, though, where we should begin, right? Because mm -hmm. now I know don't pour lots of facts at them. But when you made your analogy to the uh, x-rays and flights, I thought you were going to take it in a different direction. I was thinking, great, so this is what I should be doing. I should make an analogy to something that the person is going to be familiar with, and that way they'll be a little more comfortable with them, and I'm not just pouring more data and numbers at them. I'm giving them something they're they can relate to. Mm -hmm. And then you turned it around and said, well, I still hiked up my uh, my lead to, to cover me. So mm -hmm. so I'm I'm not sure where I should where I should go. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I like now I know that this is what um uh, that I shouldn't be pouring more information at them, but where, you know, where do I how do I get at that emotion? And what if it's a situation where they're not even 
clear on it themselves, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just nervous. I'm just nervous. I don't know why it's be, and they might give you reasons. They might not give you reasons, but like, how do we, how do we get under that? How do we get into that? Brett, you brought up a very important, a very good distinction, which one is we have strategies to make information easier to understand, right? For example, when you use an analogy, an analogy helps me understand that, oh, this is how it works, right? And an analogy might not be emotional at all. But the first thing that is that important thing is that emotional connection, right? That means being able to build a connection with someone so that they feel comfortable to talk to you and even explore those emotions that they might not know what it is, right? Those feelings, those anxieties. So I might think a general sense of anxiety. And if I get to say, okay, so how how are you feeling? Well, I'm anxious. So why are you anxious? Well, you know, because it's a fact vaccine, it's scary. I don't know what is it gonna do. Can did you hear something that made you feel anxious? And these kind of questions, um, it's kind of, you have two types of questions that you ask. You have the open questions, right? How do you feel? Like, um, why are you afraid of something? And sometimes you can help your patient and the people that come to you by making them a little more specific. If it's hard for them to say, hey, this is exactly why I feel worried, then you can even bring up that, listen, there's a lot of different things that people might be worried about and we can talk about some of them. Is it because of this one thing? Is it because of this other thing? Sometimes it's okay to put some options so that people can tell what they're worried about. Is it that you're worried about your family? Is it that you're worried about yourself? Is it that you're worried about the side effects, especially things that you hear more often from your patients, right? Something that you all have, which is so valuable, is that you have a database of information of things that your patients might be worried about, right? So when if they don't know, you can be like, hey, are you? is it specifically the side effects? Because we can talk about that, right? Is it specifically about the process that was produced? We can talk about that. So, so that first step, right, before you get to that analogy, because analogy is still the information, is just building that relationship. And relationships come from being able to listen, being able to observe, being able to tell someone that their emotions are legit, right? I, I always think about this the same way I think about my good friends, You have friends that you want to talk to them about something. You break up with your boyfriend. You go to them and they're like, oh, this boyfriend was horrible. I already told you about them. This and this and this. And there are friends that are like, oh, I'm sorry. It must feel horrible. And they listen to you and they're kind and they ask you questions and they ask you how you're doing, how do you think you want to move on, right? Until later when that relationship is built, then they can be like, hey, these are some of the ways you can, you know, take care of yourself. These are some of the things you can do. Does that does that help? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yep. it, it's just yeah. It's about digging. I was I was um, a little concerned though when you said you know, give them suggestions that like now you're mm-hmm. gonna plan. Maybe it's something they weren't nervous about, and now they're nervous mm-hmm. about it because you planted the idea. Oh, mm-hmm. you know, is it what makes you nervous? Is that you know those four cases of of Bell's palsy that occurred mm-hmm. in the in the vaccine group, they'd be like, what cases of Bell's palsy? <laughs> what are you talking? But you're saying, but but the way you said it was more, it's more general questions. It's not specific questions and going through the common things that you've heard from 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 our other patients. So yeah, that was uh that was very helpful. Absolutely. You have a great, yes, that's a very great point because you don't want to, it's kind of like, so this is like also like one of the rules of misinformation, right? Sometimes someone hasn't heard about a misinformation and I would be like, hey, did you hear this misinformation? This is wrong. And what I already did is like, I put this in your head that like, oh, there's this misinformation and it might be true. And now you're telling me it's wrong. So you don't want to like bring up all these things that might not be true. You want to, as you said, have this general ideas of like, is it one of these things that you might want to explore? Is it about like side effects that you're worried is about? Especially a few things that are important is um, access, right? Things that would help people make a decision. So I'm going to move a little to the behavior change theories that we have in like the whole uh, field of health communication. And for someone to change a behavior or change an attitude, right, first of all, they have to know that doing that thing is good, right? It brings a lot of benefits. That's why we keep telling people, hey, vaccines are good. 
The second thing is for them to realize that if they don't do it, it's bad. So, hey, if you don't get vaccinated, these are all the bad things that could happen. Then it's self-efficacy for them to feel like they can do it, right? And that's kind of where that accessibility comes into play, where you could say, hey, these are the ways you can get access to it. These are the ways we might be able to help you get to a center that you could get vaccination for. And eventually it's norms. They're like, hey, these are all the other people that have gotten the vaccine too, right? Like I have gotten it. And I've seen a lot of my patients have been getting it and they're like okay with it or things that have happened. And, and I think that kind of covers those things that you bring up that like, are you wondering about the benefits that the vaccine has? Are you wondering about what might happen if you don't get it? Are you worried about being able to have access to the vaccines, right? Are you wondering like if other people have gotten it or not? How do you do the phrasing of it when you're telling people that other people have gotten it? Because I feel like I would have trouble coming up with that specific idea, right? Mm -hmm. Well, my other patients are getting it, you mm -hmm. know, like, but, but patients don't think of themselves as my other patients. They think of, you know, they're, everyone is unique. And mm -hmm. so I'm not, I, I have different concerns than your other patients. I'm not like your other, like, how do I, I see what you're saying. It's like the bandwagon effect, right? The more people that do it, the more, this was on a previous show with, uh, with Jonathan Howard, where we, where we talked about cognitive biases and how we can use cognitive biases to get more people vaccinated. So this is the bandwagon effect, right? The more people that get it, the more it becomes commonplace to do it, the less daunting it seems and the more comfortable people are with it. So, um, but I don't know how to, how to communicate that idea effectively. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I think the first thing that is important is actually knowing those numbers and those facts and relating the this to the communities, to the groups, to the social groups that those people belong to, right? So if for example, right, I if for, for example, I'm a doctor in a community of um, Iranians, right? Iranian immigrants. So I'm an Iranian immigrant. And if I have numbers on the percentage, for example, of immigrants like me who got vaccinated, then that might be something that I could bring up if that's a concern. So for example, listen, I know this might be something that would worry you. If, if it might be helpful to know, there's like a lot of people I know from like the Iranian community actually Actually, this number of people that have gotten vaccinated, we have talked about these kind of things. They had questions. I've answered all of the questions. Let me know if you have any questions, right? So just bringing up that your in-group, your communities, the people that you trust and you belong to have gotten those vaccines. But at the same time, you also bring up something important, which is I, I need to know those information, right? I need to know how to bring it up. Like if I don't know Iranians are getting vaccinated and I tell you, hey, all the Iranians in town or getting vaccinated and I talk to all of my friends and realize like, oh, actually no one did, right? Then that kind of destroys that trust. Yeah. Well, I think that's something, particularly in the Black community, where there is mistrust of the medical establishment mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with good reason, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, there's a history of mistreatment. And even now, there, there was just a study that came out. I, I, I can't quote it exactly, but like the infant mortality when the care is by a non-black physician versus a black physician, it's higher if it's if it's under the care of a non-black physician, significantly so. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's reason for mistrust there. But at the same time, the rate of vaccination in the, in the black community is is lower. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I, I don't I don't know how to address, and I want to have a separate episode on this topic, mm -hmm. like, you know, addressing hesitations in, in communities that have justifiable mistrust. Mm -hmm. But what would your, what would your advice be if, if there isn't that uptake, but, you know, but, but it's, but it's important that there is. Yeah. Um, as it relates to that trust building, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. So basically in the whole, um, trust field. I like in English, I, there's a lot of Persian words that I like better than English words, but um, in I English... My, I, most of my audience is not going to understand it. <laughs> Even though at but, some point this podcast came on a number 73 podcast, medical podcast in Iran. It was... Uh, I oh, really? Well, it's funny. When you, when you podcast and, and you're not like in the top 100 in the United States... Um, they give you all these random statistics for it in other countries. So one day I might be number 25 in Trinidad. And the next no. time I'm, um, you know, 
number 74 in Guyana. Uh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. maybe at one yeah, point yeah. it was up there. So sorry, we're getting, we're getting yeah. off track. We're talking oh, about- Oh, no, 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 wait. So for all the Persian listener, I'm yeah. sorry that this, but there's one word that I really like in English better. And that is trustworthy because it says something about you have to make yourself a worthy person of someone's trust. Mm. I think a lot of times we, I might think that, oh, I have to change people's perception of my trust, right? That they should trust me. And I think when we think of this as the word trustworthy, it means, no, how do I make myself worthy of someone's trust? And exactly what you brought up is that idea that there is very legit reason for a lot of people not to trust us. So how do we build that trust? How do we make ourselves more trustworthy? And again, a big part of this comes back to listening and really hearing what the concerns are and really addressing those concerns. And um, so in, the, in, in some of the research, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little about how you build that trust worthy persona as well. We know the way we think of people is in, in, in kind of stereotypical ways. In, in some ways, it's like a combination of how competent you are, which means, oh, you're a person that can get things done, is very organized, can make good decisions. And then you have how warm you are, which is how friendly you are, how nice, nice you are, all this like bubbly, warm feelings. So if you're very competent, right, but you're not warm, then that means, hey, you could actually cause harm because you can get things done. You could be an evil scientist and I don't trust you. I don't trust your intentions. And what we want is building that trust, saying that, hey, okay, I'm competent. I can develop vaccines. I can do all these other things, but I'm not an evil scientist. I actually have good intentions. I am actually friendly. I actually am doing all of these things for good. And I think this, this combination is something that could build a trust uh, for the general public and especially for communities like Black people who have been, who have very good reason not to trust a lot of like communities, the government, the medical community. And that comes with not only being able to be warm, to listen, to care, but a part of that trust also comes from having people that Black doctors talking about what they think about these vaccines, right? And what their concerns are and how they hear people out. So it's a whole, it's a process. It's a process of building a trust and who we involve to build that trust, who we involve um, to advocate for them and to address some some blind spots that a, a lot of us might be having. Well, to build on that issue of trust, mm -hmm. many times we don't have all the answers to our patients' questions about the vaccine, right? We might not be able to, I mean, so far my experience is that their questions tend to be more general. But if I do have someone who has a very specific question, I might not have the answer. But ultimately, mm -hmm. I have trust in the system, right? I have trust that the systems are in place and enough people are checking and double checking such that, you know, the, the benefits of the vaccine far outweigh any risks of the vaccine. So mm -hmm. I've decided to get it myself because I have trust in the system. How do I help my yeah. patients to share in that trust? Yeah, and I think that all kind of goes back to the previous, like the discussion that we just had. And I think the good news is that the trust in the medical community is fairly high, right? That is already very good on its own. But also, again, I go back on realizing that we already have the competence com component, right? That people know that we have the competence to do a lot of things, but they might be hesitant about our intentions. So how do we communicate those intentions? How do we show ourselves as the community that people can trust? And I think some of it is a change in how the media, especially science fiction, pop culture references, might be showing the scientific community. You have, you know, the Frankenstein and the characters that are like evil genius who's yeah. very smart and capable, but also wants to destroy the world. And um, they can communicate with the public. They try to say something and no one listens to them. I, I think a big part of that would be how do we 
talk to people in a way that is like, hey, this is me as a human with my concerns and the the passions that I have. I think a lot of people, uh, I'm hoping most people that join the medical community are the people that want to do service, that have all these good intentions. Talk about them. Talk about who you are. Talk about what your motivation is. What's your backstory? So it's like the so it's like the transitive property of trust. Basically, I trust in the system, and so if I get the patient to trust in me, they therefore trust in the system. So by getting them to trust me, it also gets them to trust in the system because I trust the system. I, I, in some ways, yeah. And I would like to think, hopefully or not hopefully, if something happens that the trust in system goes up and down, right? You are still the trusted source. You know, it's kind of like um, if, if you're with a group of friends and then you realize like, oh, all of that group of friends uh, did something or said something about you that was really heartbreaking, but there's this like one person in that group that you built a really good relationship with, you might be like, hey, like, I know you were not one of them. I know you were cool, right? So I, I think it's that, yes, it definitely helps with that trust in the whole system. But at the same time, those smaller individual connections can help you feel like, oh, even if I have this larger question or doubt about a system that said something, I can still talk to Brad because I trust Brad. I can go to him and be like, hey, like I've heard this thing happening. Is this is this real? Like, should I do that? What do you think? Right? Because I have a personal relationship and trust with you. So it sounds like the biggest potential misstep would be dismissing someone's concerns, right? Like mm-hmm. just completely blowing them off. So we've we've you know we've been discussing that. But are there any other potential oh and another misstep you mentioned was bringing up misinformation that the patient themselves didn't bring up. So by bringing it up you're even planting the seed that there is a possibility that this thing is true. So don't bring up misinformation that the parent, patient hasn't brought up mm-hmm. and don't dismiss their concerns. Right? Mm-hmm. Are there any other potential missteps when discussing the vac- vaccine? Any big ones that we should avoid? This may be a little more in the philosophy of how we see these connections. Do you mind if I go to a little bit of a, a deeper how Please. we think of ourselves? Okay. <laughs> so I think, and this is something that I do as well, we are a lot of times very goal oriented very destination oriented, that we see that, you know, flag at the end, which it says, destination, get vaccinated. I really want to just get there. And the way I think of it is like, you know, just like video games, there's like, you see the prize, you see the door that goes to the next level. And like right next to it is this gigantic um, valley, right? And you're like, well, I have a few lives, so I'm going to just jump and see if I can get there. Um, and then obviously you jump and die. But you know that the way to go is like, mm, that's it's probably not jumping over the valley. I have to go through all these pathways and collect all of these coins and get to talk to a few people and all of that. And eventually I get to that, you know, last door. And it's kind of that idea that really, as cliche as it sounds, the journey matters the most. The journey is part of that goal and that destination. You get to instead of entering these conversations, thinking that by the end of this conversation, I'm going to get this person to agree to get vaccinated. Rather than that, how can I think that I'm going to start this conversation, go through this conversation, hoping that by the end of this conversation, I've heard this person out and we have had a conversation and I was able to tell them that their feelings are legit and let's talk about some of these concerns especially because what if when you're on this journey, right? It's science, science changes. What if when I'm on this journey, the goal, the destination suddenly changes, right? What if I realize that, oh, maybe there's like this one other step that we want the patients or, you know, the the public to do before vaccination or instead of vaccination. And if, if I have very laser focused have been thinking of that goal, that destination, then there is no relationship. But if I have thought about that journey and that relationship, then somewhere on the way and be like, hey, you know, all these conversations we had, actually, we think it might be better if you do this, if we can talk about doing this other alternative. So I would say that pitfall is that starting these conversations, always thinking that I'm going to change this person's mind about vaccines. And rather thinking we're actually having a conversation so that hopefully by the end of it, they have the tools to make the decision to get vaccines. 
and I have a relationship with this person. It's not binary. It's not like if they get vaccinated, you win. And if they don't get vaccinated, you lose. Although I guess it is binary in that if along the way you lose their trust, then then it's over. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. that's not the goal. The goal is to nudge them in the right direction, not necessarily mm-hmm. to get them vaccinated, but to earn their trust and just nudge them a little bit in the right direction. That's that's interesting because that's been brought up on, on other episodes before I had before, I think it might have even been before the the pandemic started, I had someone on to talk about vaccines just in general because she wrote a book about, about vaccines, Gretchen LaSalle, the family physician. And uh and and that's that was her point was that it's not it's not a single conversation. Like you're you're you will have other opportunities to talk to this patient about it again. And even if you're, let's say you're an urgent care physician and you're only going to see this person this one time, you're not the only time that someone's going to interface with the medical, this person's going to interface with the medical establishment. Your job is to keep their trust in the system and just nudge them a little bit in the right direction. Because if they hear it from you and hear it from someone else and someone else and someone else, well, then all of those little nudges will end up, you know, keeping them not from not being alienated and moving them closer and closer to getting vaccinated. So that's, uh, mm-hmm. it's it's the journey, it's not the destination. Yeah, I love that, Brad. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think as science communicators, we really have to realize that it really is not me and it's not this one time. And it's hard because you, you want to see the effect, right? You want to see the impact. You want to have this concrete thing that you hold and say, this is the result of my conversation, right? So it's it's painful to be like, well, I might never see what the effect of this conversation was, but it might have been that I, I have a conversation and they're like, oh, this person actually listened to me. So maybe they're not as horrible as I thought. And the next person would listen to them and the next person would listen to them. And that, as you said, that builds this trust in the system, that this is a system that cares for them and listens to them and maybe they could trust. Yeah, I, I mm-hmm. love I love the consistency of the messaging there. You know, that this is mm-hmm. that this has been a theme that's been on, on this show before. Uh, I love it. Mm-hmm. So let's change gears a little bit. So there are going to be stories, you know, the more the vaccine rolls out, the more you're going to hear about someone who got the vaccine and then something terrible happened because terrible ha- things happen to people all the time. So we don't know whether it's from the vaccine or just from circumstance, right? Mm-hmm. But as you said earlier, we make decisions with emotions. We don't make decisions with data. So if they heard about someone that had a complication after getting the vaccine, suddenly they're going to be a lot more concerned about it. How do we communicate the difference between correlation and causation without being patronizing? Because mm-hmm. I feel like that's how that, if I explained it, that's how it's going to come off. Well, you need to study it and we're not sure. And it just, you know, it's just a one-off situation and blah, blah, blah. And it's just going to sound really contrived and maybe even disingenuous. How, how do I get that idea mm-hmm. across? Yeah, that's, first of all, I I appreciate that you bring up this idea of being patronizing. I, I had conversations with my parents where my dad once like shared this piece of misinformation and I picked up the phone and I was like, dad, and I use my empathy skills, right? Um, I understand that you did this and it's, you know, I appreciate it that you did all of, you know, that to share information, but what do you think about this? And this might not be correct. And he was like, so weirded out because this is not the kind of relationship me and my dad have. We usually like laugh and joke and make fun of each other. Right. So suddenly I'm just like very caring, empathetic daughter. And I think he felt a little like I was being condescending. Mm. Um, And he was like, what's going on? And I was like, okay, you send me fake news, dad. (laughs) And it was just like, just tell me, (laughs) don't have to go through that. And the most important part of that is that people can tell when you're being condescending, when you're being patronizing. So understanding that you're really having a conversation and this is a mistake that you could have done as well already helps, right? That intention helps. Then I'm going to go back again to the, all the things that we talked about, and that's acknowledging feelings that, hey, this is very scary thing to hear about, right? 
it's scary and it's good that you are concerned because that shows that you're a person that cares about health, that cares about knowing more. You're curious, you're trying to understand what the evidence is, and this is good, right? So in some way, giving value to their curiosity because you do want people to be curious because what if you're not there to tell them that something is this or that? You want them to go look for information, right? So acknowledging those fears and asking them more questions that what have they seen? Sometimes I, I, I notice that's something that I do where I just assume what people are afraid of. And then I start going on a rant of this is why you shouldn't be afraid of this. And then they're like, oh, no, it wasn't that. It was something else. And I realized like, oh, I just probably added to their fears because I assumed what they were afraid of. And I went on a rant about why they shouldn't be. And now they have two things they should be afraid of. So again, that listening of what is it exactly that you're worried about, about that side effect, right? And after you have built that, that emotional connection, um, there are different things that could help. Um, one is, again, bringing up your personal experience that, hey, I got, the vaccina- I got vaccinated, I was worried about these kind of things, but then lay down the information about, you know, first of all, this is something that could have happened by coincidence because there's all these people that get back, you know, it's a big number and a shock like this could have happened even if they wouldn't have gotten vaccinated. So, so bringing your personal experience and then giving them the information. Um, and I think something that does help is mitigation. If I'm not mistaken, I know that even right now, after you get your vaccination, you have 15 minutes after where you're under observation to make sure you're not getting a shock, right? Yes. Now, whether that's something that the shock is something that happens or doesn't happen, I, as a person, that like I, I agree that it's probably something that doesn't happen, but it already makes me feel a little more comfortable knowing that, hey, for 15 minutes, which is like the critical time, I know that I'm under observation. If something happens, something someone can save me, right? So telling them why it's okay, first of all, why this is something that is probably not going to happen to you. And if for whatever mir- miraculous example, something like that happens, we have covered it like this. We have people to be there to take care of you. And at the same time, again, back to that transparency, letting them know that there are side effects that we do know and we do not know about, but here's what we do know now. And the more time passes, we will know more and you can come back and we will give you more information about what has changed and what we do know about. And keeping the doors open for conversation so that they don't feel like, okay, if this is over, then I have to, like, that's it. I have no more, like, no way, ways to ask questions. Um, I would personally, and that's that might be me, would stay away from trying to explain exactly what is the difference between causation and correlation and try to focus on that example that they're worried about, right? Like, if it's about this one person that had the specific shock, then I can tell them that, hey, maybe even with visualization, which is one of the best ways you can talk about this information. This is, hey, this is all the people that exist. Like on a normal time, on a normal day, these two people would get like a reaction like this. On vaccination day, which is all of these people who have gotten vaccinated, the same two people got these reactions, right? So I might not even delve into to what is the difference between causation and correlation, but just address that one thing because that's on its own, it's a lot of information. Got it. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. So we're just simplifying it for the example that we're using. We're not, mm-hmm. we're not scaling back to talk about what those things, how, how to define those concepts. Mm-hmm. Might end up boring and, and- the patient as well. Absolutely. And there is a patient and people, and I, I, I don't know if I should call patient because because a, a lot of people that come are not uh, patients, they're just public that want to know more about. But there are people that are, uh, they want more information and they're comforted by more information. And if they ask, I always, I think it's a good idea to tell them more because they want to know more. And there are people that are like, hey, I don't want to know more. I just want to know, can I do this or not? Right. So, so a great part of this depends on how much they want to know. Like I'm a person, when I go to the doctor, they're like, please stop asking questions, leave the office and stop reading all the pages is before you come to my <laughs> office, right? Because uh, that's just how I function. And, and again, it goes back to what the, the person that you're talking to wants and needs. My experience so far has just been the the general trepidations about it, not like mm-hmm. specific 
You know, they, I haven't had anyone that's been trying to get into the weeds with it. That being said, I'm not given the vaccine. I'm just happen mm-hmm. to be bringing it up when I see patients in the office. So mm-hmm. maybe if you're the one giving the vaccine, they might have more specific questions and you know, it makes sense to have that information available or even just resources available for the patient to take a deeper dive and like a, a trusted resource. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So do you, we talked about this before the show, your party trick. For health communication, you have an actual party trick, um, but we we were talking about whether or not you had a party trick for health communication, something that when you talk about it, it reliably causes a light bulb to go off in, or to go on rather in people's heads. So first, what's your party, your actual party trick? And then what, what's your health communication party trick? Yeah. <laughs> well, my, my real party trick is in a past life, I used to be a physiotherapist and I worked in a pediatric hospital. So I had, um, I had a, like a, like a metal, uh, teaspoon and I would, when I was with kids, sometimes I would rub that teaspoon on my nose. Um, and it would like hold it on my nose without my hands. And like kids would be like, whoa, that's so cool. And once I did that, and I was actually, uh, I was in, in the faculty at rehabilitation school's yard having my tea. And then I did that with the spoon and the kid looks at me and then the kid screams and runs away. So that was the last time I did that party trick where I hold the spoon with my nose. <laughs> <laughs> but the real, the, the thing that I do in almost all of my conversations is I avoid very strict disagreements. No, this is wrong. No, this is not how it works. And I always try to start with a very improv kind of oh, yes and. So yes, I can see how this might be confusing. Yeah, I can see how this is concerning. Yeah, I totally have felt like that before. Yeah, I read that. And the first time I read it, I totally didn't understand what it means. Um, yeah, I can see you're not a person that would just like immediately accept things. You're a curious person. And that's great. And I've noticed when I when I do that, it generally helps a lot with having people feel more open to continuing a conversation rather than saying like, nope, that's not how it works. Or like, Mm-mm, no, I've, nope, nope, that's, that's completely wrong. That has been something that always, if not a light bulb, it just kind of like, uh, if there's a door above their head, the door opens <laughs> in some ways. And, and, and I think, yeah, it's, some of it might be cultural generally, like as... Persians, sometimes like it's especially women, we, we, I think, and I might be stereotyping ourselves, but I think we're more not confrontational when we want to disagree. So I don't know. It's, it's maybe a personality thing. Do you ever do that with your dad? Um, I, I have ups and downs with him because I think when I was a teenager, I would be like, no, this is not right. You can't do that. You can tell me not to go out and everything or just on things that I would disagree with him. Now that I'm a science communicator, I don't outright say no to him unless I'm really, like, really um, frustrated (laughs) by, like, sometimes, you know, like, COVID conversations. And they're they're good. They're good with, like, um, being, like, good with masks and stuff in general. Um, But they're, like, smaller things that sometimes they don't do. And I'm like, Dad, I told you, like, a million times why you shouldn't do that. And I don't know how else I should tell you, right? Like, sometimes with your parents, you just... Yeah, you just you, lose it. You regress. You regress. It's like it's like <laughs> exactly. you're it's like you're a teenager all over again. Yeah, I can't get out of <laughs> I can't get out of that space. I can't do that. I can't get out of that space with my brother yeah. either. Um <laughs> Yeah, we can't get my dad to keep the mask over his nose. I just <laughs> you know be hanging out with he's he's that he's that person. Just uh-huh. pull it up, pull it up, just pull it up, just a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit. Um so <laughs> Uh, is there is there anything else that you'd like to discuss with our physician audience about either science communication, health communication, related to the vaccine, unrelated to the vaccine, any, anything else that you, you'd like to share with us today? I would say just remember that this is all a lot. It's a lot of mental energy, even empathizing and going through the idea of like, I'm not just going to like scream at someone and say like, but why wouldn't you just do it, right? This is all something that consumes a lot of energy. So I would just say, be very kind to yourself and take care of yourself. I know we always say that, but really think about what that means. Realizing that you will really not be able to convince everyone to do something. Sometimes your conversations are with people that are curious and are skeptics. Um, There are people that might be very hard in denial or confrontational. And sometimes with those, 
you might have to prioritize your own mental health and take breaks and be kind to yourself because we constantly in a time like this, like I have seen myself telling myself that, well, you're not doing enough. This is not enough. You know, there are um, medical workers like you in the front line saving lives and I'm sitting here behind my computer typing, right? So just this idea of, as my friend, Dr. J says, you are enough. So yeah, yeah, I just, be kind to yourself. Thank you. I really <laughs> I appreciate that. I need to take that to heart. And I'm sure a lot of our physician colleagues need to as well. Give ourselves a little grace, especially now, especially mm-hmm. now. You are enough. I, well, I really appreciate you saying that and, and all the rest of the advice that you gave us for uh, for health communication involving the vaccine uh, to, to make sure that we can convince as many people or rather help them convince themselves to, to get mm-hmm. it. So I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Sure. It was wonderful chatting with you. Thanks for having me. As a reminder, today's sponsor is the Alpha Coaching Experience. Act now to claim your spot in the spring enrollment before the doors close on February 22nd at midnight. There is no better time than now to make the change you know you deserve to be a better partner, parent, and physician. Enroll today at drpodcastnetwork.com slash alpha. That's drpodcastnetwork.com slash alpha. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.